Hello everyone, this is Serious Trivia, and today we're continuing our Jianwei's Northern Expeditions Let's Talk Lore series with Episode 5, titled A Coordinated Attack. Before we get started, here's the answer to the trivia question from the end of our last episode, and be sure to stay tuned until the end of this episode for a brand new trivia question. Now last time we concluded by discussing the aftermath of Jianwei's 5th Northern Expedition, as aside from trying out a new Northern attack route, the most important thing to come out of this rather short raid would be the capture of Guo Xiu, a defecting Wei officer who would rise quickly through the Shuhan ranks all the way to the general of the left, only to leverage his new post to assassinate the Shuhan Grand General, Fei Yi, during a New Year's feast in 253. But out of this tragedy, there was a silver lining as now without Fei Yi to limit the scale of Jiang Wei's northern expeditions, Jiang Wei could finally plan grander campaigns. Yet before Jiang Wei could make any plans of his own in 253, a coordinated attack plan was presented to the Shuhan court by a Wu official named Li Heng, who represented the new Wu regent in Zhuge Ke. As you see, just the year prior in 252, Sun Quan, the founding emperor of the kingdom of Wu, had just died of natural causes at the advanced age of 71, and in his favoritism towards his then prized concubine turned empress Pan Shu, Sun Quan decided to pass the throne of Wu to his youngest son in Sun Liang, who was the son of Pan Shu, even though he was not yet 10 years old. So naturally, given the young age of the new emperor of Wu, the kingdom of Wu needed a regent, and the role passed on to Zhuge Ke, who is the son of Zhuge Jin, and thus the nephew of Zhuge Liang. Now, immediately after Sun Quan's death, Sima Shi, the eldest son of the now deceased Sima Yi, and the regent in control of the Wei court, decided to launch a massive three-pronged campaign against Wu during this transitional period of weakness. Yet Sima Shi's plan would ultimately fail when the Eastern Front at Dongxing would suffer a catastrophic defeat, forcing the other two fronts to abandon their attacks altogether, handing the new Wu regent Zhuge Ke a massive victory to kick off his regency. Now for those who are interested in details of this campaign, please consider subscribing to the channel as there will be a future Let's Talk Lore series focused on Zhuge Ke's regency as it will be our next Kingdom of Wu focus series. But for our series at hand here, we're only going to focus on how Zhuge Ke's victory at the Battle of Dongxing would impact Jiang Wei's next northern expedition, as Wu's success in its defense against Wei at this battle only served to embolden the young and ambitious Zhuge Ke, as in the following year of 253, Zhuge Ke would start his plan of a grand offensive campaign against Wei, with a total planned troop count of over 200,000. And as part of this plan, Zhuge Ke wanted Wu's ally in the kingdom of Shuhan to launch a coordinated attack out west, which is why Zhuge Ke's Sima, or military advisor, Li Heng, would be sent to Shuhan at this time to present this plan. Upon hearing Zhuge Ke's plan, the Shuhan court agreed and Jiang Wei would be tasked with launching his now 6th northern expedition as part of the coordinated attack with Wu. But given the time-sensitive nature of this request, Jiang Wei could not use his new northern path, as in the summer of 253, as Zhuge Ke's massive 200,000 army would put New Hefei Castle back under siege, Jiang Wei would march north from Wudu, out of the area around Shiying, where he had previously encamped, to attack the Wei garrisons in Nan'an and Longxi, with a particular focus on a garrison at the D path. Now, the most important thing about this campaign is that, for the first time in Jiang Wei's career, he had more than 10,000 troops under his command, partially due to Fei Yi's death earlier in the year. But more importantly, even if Fei Yi had been alive, the Shuhan court would most likely have given Jiang Wei more troops for this campaign, simply to show good faith to their allies' request as Zhuge Ke was launching attack with 200,000 troops. Of course, Jiang Wei and the Kingdom of Shuhan did not have the population or the resources to match Zhuge Ke's troop count, and from historical records, it only states that Jiang Wei had tens of thousands of troops for this campaign, 
which I would estimate to be no more than 40,000, just given the fact that when Shu Han surrendered to Wei in 263, Zhong Hui reported back to the Wei courts that Jiang Wei's troop count at the time of the surrender was between 40 and 50,000 troops. Thus, with this being Jiang Wei's first campaign with increased troop count, it's most likely a gentle ramp up, so a number under 40,000 would make the most sense. Now, with Jiang Wei and Zhuge Ke launching coordinated attack on Wei at the same time in 253, the ball was now in Sima Shi's court, as he had to decide how to commit Wei's resources in combating both threats. Logically, given the sheer size of Zhuge Ke's army and the recent defeat in the south at Dongxing, it might seem that the best plan would be to focus entirely on repelling Zhuge Ke while largely ignoring Jiang Wei's incursion given small size. But Sima Shi's advisor in Yu Song give a very different assessment. Citing an example from the Seven Princes Rebellion during the early period of the Western Han Dynasty, Yu Song warned Sima Shi from relying simply on appearances as the enemy who appears to be strong might actually turn out to be weak. Well, an enemy who appears to be weak and inconsequential might actually turn out to be a strong threat. By looking into the details, one can argue that even though Zhuge Ke's army of 200,000 is numerous in number, his decision to siege New Hefei Castle shows his desire to draw out Wei reinforcements in the area for a decisive field battle while the Wei Eastern Forces' morale was still low from their recent devastating loss at the Battle of Dongxing. Thus, the best course of action against Zhuge Ke would be to use the strong fortifications at New Hefei Castle to grind away at their army morale and will to fight, as even with 3,000 defenders, New Hefei Castle is more than capable of fending off the Wu forces for at least one to two months. During this time, instead of using just local reinforcements, the central government could organize a much bigger reinforcement force and keep them fresh at a distance, denying Zhuge Ke the open field battle that he seeks. Then once the Wu army has exhausted themselves in the siege of New Hefei Castle, the reinforcement can then sweep in and defeat Zhuge Ke's worn down forces. Meanwhile, on the western front, while Jiang Wei's army is much smaller in size, it's clear that he's far more opportunistic and mobile, as early reports have stated that the Shu Han army has targeted mainly farming areas as their main goal seems to be just pillaging and gathering supplies to sustain their campaign while stealing away Wei's harvests at the same time. Given this information, Yu Song argued that Jiang Wei and the Shu Han side are probably counting on success from Zhuge Ke on the Eastern Front to draw away more of Wei's western garrisons in Chang'an before committing to any decisive military actions. With such a mentality, they would never expect a strong show of force against them out west, which is precisely what we should do, as if we have both Guo Huai and Chen Tai send their armies to reinforce Nan'an and Longxi, Jiang Wei would certainly retreat, as he would believe that such a commitment could only mean that Zhuge Ke's attack out east had failed, and surely, when news of Guo Huai and Chen Tai's reinforcements were well on their way towards Nan'an and Longxi, Jiang Wei made the easy decision to pull his armies back to the Shu Han side of the boundary, as he was already suffering from supply issues with the Shu Han side not being well prepared for such a rushed northern expedition given Wu's sudden request, especially with Jiang Wei's now increased troop count. Not long after, news of Zhuge Ke's defeat out east at New Hefei Castle would reach Jiang Wei, as his sixth northern expedition would conclude without much action or success. But despite this, the Shu Han Imperial Court would actually summon Jiang Wei all the way back to Chengdu in January of 254 to hand over full military control over to him, as he became the natural choice in this military role after Grand General Fei's assassination the year prior. At the same time, the Shu Han court also would receive a secret missive from the Wei garrison commander at the Di Path in Li Jian, as Li Jian would express his desire to surrender the garrison to the Shu Han side. Naturally, given Fei's recent assassination at the hands of a defected Wei officer, most in the Shu Han court were concerned about the sincerity of Li Jian's intention to defect, 
But with General Zhang Yi standing firm in support of accepting Li Jian's surrender, the Shuhan court would eventually get behind the idea of sanctioning Jiang Wei's seventh northern expedition in conjunction with Li Jian's defection in order to maximize Shu Han's gains. And to find out if Li Jian's defection is indeed genuine and the result of Jiang Wei's seventh northern expedition, come back next time as we'll continue our series here tomorrow with episode six. Hopefully you all have enjoyed this episode enough to consider subscribing to the channel for more content on Three Kingdoms history or simply support the channel with a like or a comment below. And as always, I'll see you all next time. Bye.